for joining everyone. Why don't you type your name, where you're Zooming in from, and your organization so we can start getting a sense of where you're all calling in from. Welcome again, and we'll get started in a few minutes. People are still joining. New Mexico, Alaska. We knew we'd have Alaska. Texas, it's great to see where you're all calling in from. We'll get started in just a few minutes to all of you who are joining. Welcome. Great, we have the Missouri Green Schools, several from Missouri. Welcome to everyone. Oregon, hope things are going better out there. Hello everyone, we'll get started in a few minutes. And what time do you have? Ready to go? 101. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education. And we are so happy that you have joined us today for this um, wonderful webinar. I know you have been on a million Zoom calls and a million virtual conferences, and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, I think you're in for a real treat. And I'm always excited about our webinars, but particularly on a webinar that's talking about how do we move place-based learning online, given all the online work that we're all doing. So as I'm doing this quick intro, if you have a tip that you've used for online learning, please go ahead and put it in the chat. We're gonna keep learning from each other throughout this webinar. Just write it in the chat. And I'm really happy to say that this webinar is a partnership with the Bureau of Land Management. We're really happy to have our friends online today. And also the Kansas Association for Conservation and Environmental Education. And we do have an incredible panel today and I will introduce all of them in just a minute. Um, but we couldn't have a better collection of educators who will be helping us think about online learning. For those of you who have been part of our webinars, you know that we are trying to bring new ideas and new speakers and new thinking to our field during this pandemic, but also just to the field in general as we all try to imagine what is the future of education going to look like. And so we have been so lucky to have such talented panelists like we have today. Um, and thanks again to our affiliate co-hosts from around North America who are helping to support this webinar series and make sure to get out the word to everyone as we um, conduct these for um, everyone, not just North America, but around the world. So today we are focusing on new ideas for moving place-based learning online. We know that a big chunk of education, not just in the United States, but in Canada, in Mexico, in other parts of the world, is online and every country, every state, every region is different. There is a mix of in-person with a lot of guidelines, there's hybrid and there's a lot of online learning. 
And there are a lot of questions that come with online learning. What is good online learning? Who doesn't have connections? How do we measure the effectiveness of what we're doing? How is online learning affecting um, young people and adult learners' health? So mental health as well as physical health from sitting in a chair all day. Um, but we also know the value of place-based learning and how do we combine place-based learning and think about how do we move that online? So our goal is always to take the power of technology and couple it with the power of education, but thinking about what are we trying to accomplish in education first, and then how can technology help back that up? We also know that many people have talked about the digital divide, and I think in our field of environmental education, we are working to help address this digital divide, knowing that many people do not have access to computers or high-speed internet, that makes it even harder. And many of our young people and adults around the world don't have access to nature and outdoor spaces. So what are some of the ideas that given the state of the world that we can think about with virtual learning to enhance our environmental education work? And we have done a number of webinars on this topic. This is one of the most asked for topics that we have had. And we did one a few weeks ago on design principles for online EE, and it's recorded if you missed that, of what does the research say about design principles as you're thinking about online learning. And I encourage you to look at that and others. We're gonna be talking about some of the cool tools that are out there that can help with online learning um, from Padlet to um, Mentimeter and Slido and all different kinds of tools that are out there. And we'll get a chance to see how does the federal agency adapt and we're really looking forward to hearing from the Bureau of Land Management and how does one of our affiliates think about online learning with Laura Downey. You can um, interact with us through the chat. You can send a note to all panelists or all of us that are, have our videos on or you can send a note to everyone. and Everyone will get a copy of the chat. So make sure you um, please enter questions and ideas and comments and resources into the chat. Everybody will also get a copy of the PowerPoints and you'll get a copy of the recording. So looking forward to seeing the chatter in the chat box. And we also have live captioning today and thanks to our captioner, Katie Johnson for doing this. For those of you who need the captioning, please use it. I also want to always thank my colleague Anne, who is the guru of this webinar series and is helping on the technology, but also the content, and she'll wrap this up. She is our Director of Professional Development and the Manager of EE360. So now the best part is introducing our speakers for today, and I'm going to do very quick intros, and you can find out more about them online. We have a talented crew here, and I'm going to start with our first speaker, who is Laura Downey. And Laura is incredible. She is, and of course, I just lost my notes here, so I'm going to have to do this by um, memorization, is the Executive Director of the Kansas Association for Conservation and Environmental Education. She is such a talented leader in the field of environmental education. She's a former Chicago public school teacher. She moved to Kansas about 25 years ago and then just continued teaching students. And in 2000, she became the Executive Director of the Affiliate which is a 501c3 organization. It's all about accelerating environmental literacy and conservation in Kansas, Kansas through non-biased science-based environmental education. And Laura has been a leader with the affiliate network and I'm just so lucky to work with her. And then we have Rachel who is um, the Bureau of Land Management's Education Program Lead. She previously served as an education specialist and national outdoor ethics coordinator for headquarters at BLM. And she worked in the King Range National Conservation Area as the outdoor recreation planner and interpretive and education specialist, where she developed and launched education and youth engagement programs with many, many partners in schools. She also worked as an education specialist in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Her passion for environmental education began when she was a high school student, volunteering a bunch of hours at a science camp in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California. And then we have Louisa Wolfline. Louisa is Public Programs and Statewide Coordinator at the BLM Campbell Creek Science Center in Anchorage, Alaska. She joined the Science Center team 18 years after working 18 years ago, after working as an environmental education consultant, a freelance writer, a science teacher, 
and an environmental education um, specialist at both World Wildlife Fund and the National Wildlife Federation. And that's where I was so lucky to work with her at both NWF and WWF, and I'm so happy she's with us today. And then we have Nancy Patterson, um, who is serving as the director of the BLM Campbell Creek Science Center in Alaska with Louisa. She holds an MS in conservation social sciences with a focus on international protected area management and environmental communications from the University of Idaho. Her background includes work in social science research, visitor services, interpretation, recreation, and administration. And she has worked for the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, and the Tikal National Park in Guatemala. And last but not least, we have Derek, who spent the last 25 years pursuing his passion for the outdoors and our irreplaceable public lands, working seasonal positions for the Forest Service and the National Park Service before he landed a permanent job with BLM in 2002 as a member of BLM's National Heritage Education Team. In 2008, he joined the BLM's Division of Education Interpretation and Partnerships as the Education Specialist, and he, he focused on developing national level partnerships and supporting the field offices to increase place-based learning, youth engagement, and youth employment. So, so excited to have this amazing team, and I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Let's give them a wonderful virtual applause. Thank you so much, Judy, and um, hello, everyone. Judy, I appreciate your gracious introduction and love having the opportunity to work with NAAAE and was very excited today to um, get to share some of our strategies that we've been using um, to adapt environmental education or place-based education for virtual learning and virtual settings. And I'm coming at this from the standpoint of many, we support environmental educators in our state um, doing some great place-based education. And um, many of them have awesome activities that they like to use when they're face-to-face -face with their audiences and suddenly found themselves um, earlier this year in a position where they couldn't do that. So we started really thinking about what might be the process for adapting those favorite activities that we do into a virtual setting. So Anna, if you'd advance that slide. We started thinking about what are those key questions um, that we needed to consider when we were thinking about designing virtual learning experiences. And really starting with what are the key concepts that we were wanting to teach. Um, thinking back to the original activity that we used um, when we were face to face, what were the original learning procedures and what experiences do we want our learners to have when they're participating with us virtually. Then we started thinking about some effective ways to take advantage of technology. And I'm a big believer in taking advantage of technology. Technology can offer some opportunities that we might not have if we were teaching face-to-face, -face, um, including some ways that we could address equity. And I'll talk about that just a little bit more. Um, and then we, we did start thinking about um, how is the learning experience, um, what are the tools and the logistics for, de for delivering that learning experience? And I thought maybe the best way to illustrate a process that we've used, and this is certainly only one process, I'm sure there are many others, but um, to go through an actual activity that we did an adaptation for and kind of show you the process in the activity format. So if you'd advance that slide for us, please, Anne. Um, I think probably many of you are familiar with um, Project Wild. And there's an activity um, that they have called Limiting Factors, How Many Bears? And so we looked at the key concepts that were um, being taught in that activity. And it's about limiting factors and habitat and impact on wildlife populations with limiting factors. And the original procedures of this activity, the students became bears and they forage for different tokens. that They didn't know what they were exactly other than that they were different types of foods. And some of the bears had some, um, um, some additional needs or challenges, like maybe a mother with a cub or a bear that had been blinded or injured. And in the process of doing this activity, they were moving around, collecting these tokens, and then they, and they used that as data that they could gather and analyze. And so we recognized that we needed to have some sort of 
um, activity where there was a, um, a model where data could be generated, collected, and analyzed. That's a key part of understanding for this. And then how can we take advantage of the technology? So we were thinking about things like smaller groups could make for better discussions and there were opportunities for simulations. Um, and that there are also some really great tools for sharing data and collecting data and, and analyzing that data. So we started with figuring out what might be the technology that we could use to give them a simulated experience. So if you could flip the slide, please, Dan. We landed on, after a number of research, and I'm gonna share a bunch of the tools that we've found, but we landed after a bunch of research on, a, um, um, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, a tool called Flippity. And Flippity um, allows you to create um, a number of different learning tools, but one of them is actually a board game. And the board game allows the um, participants to get into small groups and to play this game. And along the way, if you would um, connect to the next slide, please, Anne. Along the way, um, you can modify and adapt Flippity to have the squares that the students land on or the participants land on to equal different things. So in the original activity, the tokens that they were collecting were nuts and berries and insect and meat, and some of them were water cards, and um, there were different amounts of, um, of these items that the bears were foraging for. And so we were able to create the spaces to represent some of those different cards. And the cool thing about Flippity is it's actually, they're um, spreadsheets, Google Sheets, that you download, you can modify, and then where that red circle is, and I'm not sure you can see it super well, it's, um, you click to that link in it, and you will get, to, or that tab, and you will get a link directly to that game, and that link can be shared to the students, and then they can all play the game. Um, they can play it individually, or they could play it as groups. So we tried this out, and tested it out, and thought, yes, this will give us sort of similar results to kids actually going and foraging for their tokens or food um, in a face-to-face um, -face setting. And then we started thinking about, and if you'll um, click to the next slide, please, Anne, um, we started thinking about what else will we need for students in order to um, be able to deliver this. So we needed some sort of delivery platform. And um, you can use synchronous platforms like we're using here today with Zoom or GoToMeeting or asynchronous platforms like um, Google Classrooms or Moodle. We decided to use a synchronous platform because it was really important for the interaction to be happening with this game. And then we thought, what other tools and resources are we going to need in order for students to be able to do this activity? So. Um, we recognized that we needed to have a spreadsheet for them to record and analyze their data. Um, and we also needed a student activity, um, or sorry, student direction page. And these are both created in Google, um, with Google tools. And the reason why we've created it with Google tools is that it's super easy in an online platform then to share a link to that and have the participants be able to access that immediately. Um, we certainly did a number of trial runs to make sure that it was um, uh, doing what we were hoping it would do and it would give us the results that we were hoping it would give us, that students would get the kind of data that showed, for example, the bear um, that has cubs needs more food and it was, um, uh, the totals didn't always add up, that the, there was enough food for a mother bear and two cubs, or the, the um, animal that was injured had a more difficult time getting the number of tokens and the amount of food that they needed to survive. So after we got those trial runs sorted out and uh, in good shape, we refined the procedures and then we wrote it up. And if you would advance to the next slide, please, Dan. And it's really key, it was really key for us to <clears throat> write up the activities. That gave us even more clarity about what we wanted to do. Um, and made sure that we had all the steps and procedures in place because when you're teaching in an online setting, having those steps pretty clear in your head are, is very important. And one of the things that we always include in all of our activities are opportunities to get outdoors. Um, so in this activity, we were having students think about in their own um, environments, in their own settings, 
what were some of the populations of wildlife species they might find and see outside and go go take a look and see what they're looking at and then think about what are some of the limiting factors for those species to be able to survive and exist and then we also have been working really hard in doing virtual field trips um, and so we've had the opportunity to work with some of our local partners for example um, uh, the education director out of the Kanza Prairie um, was able to take students on a virtual field trip where she was live on Zoom and walking um, and talking about, actually she was talking about seeds at that point in time um, that were um, found out on the prairie and we were talking about seeds and adaptations. So, and if you would um, advance the next slide. I'm going to share with you some free tools that we found. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but they are some tools that we have found to be really helpful for engaging um, audiences in virtual settings. And I mentioned the Google Slide Sheets and Docs, and we really like those tools because the links can be easily shared. And I'm gonna share a link to a Google Doc with all of these on here in just a moment. And you'll be able to see that you can access that immediately. Um, there's lots of great virtual whiteboards like Jamboard or Miro and Padlet, which allow groups of people to work in the same space and share pictures and notations and rearrange ideas. Um, there's great simulation games and I'll share with you Flippity. There's also one we found called Classcraft um, that creates a quest and um, it allows multiple people to participate in simulated games. There's lots of great live polling and questions and word clouds. Um, uh, tools that help for more engagement with larger groups like Slido, and then some great learning management systems like um, Moodle and Google and um, all of those. And as Judy mentioned, one of the things that we've been keenly aware of as we've been developing these activities are some of the equity issues. And so there's certainly some equity issues around the digital divide and, and access to um, uh, just having the technology to be able to do these activities. And then the, the other considerations is when we're asking for people to go outside, we have to think about whether or not they have access to go outside. And so we're oftentimes also saying things like, look out your window or um, uh, go to your backyard. We're trying to make it so that we're not eliminating anybody and making them feel like they have to have some sort of natural space to be able to do any of these activities. And we're also thinking about when they're doing any hands-on that the, acti the, the materials that we're asking them to use are things that uh, could be readily found in, in any home and that there's lots of different options for different um, replacements for things so that we're not expecting our participants to have those materials in hand. So that is just a quick run through on how we thought about adapting activities for virtual learning and then it is my pleasure now to turn this over to Rachel and she's going to talk to you a little bit more about what she's doing. And Rachel, before you jump in, Laura, we did have one question about about how much this is from Kama, who said it was a wonderful adaptation. How long did it take you to plan research and develop the activity? Um, knowing that, the, that after you've done it several times, it would get quicker. But how long did that whole process take? The planning, researching, and developing the activity, um, we found it's really good to do it in a team because it's really hard to think creatively by yourself. Um, but we probably spent two to three hours developing just the ideas for this activity and then refining it further. It's, it's, it's a fair amount of labor. Um, the good news is that both Project Learning Tree and Project Wild are making these virtual adaptations that we've been working on for them um, available to people who have um, have gone through their program. So those should be coming up soon. So you won't have to do any of that development. Thanks, Laura. And go ahead, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Glad to see that we have so many um, BLM educators with us today. So the BLM and why we're jumping in the distance learning realm um, to give you a little perspective. Um, we find, you know, most of BLM lands tend to be out west. And when COVID hit and things started shutting down in the spring, um, at the headquarters level, we weren't able to provide a bureau-wide direction and guidance that we would normally hope for because 
what we, we saw was each individual state was taking a different approach based on how that state's governor was handling uh, the pandemic. And so we allowed each state to, you know, follow that lead. And um, a lot of states uh, started closing areas down, some remained open, and our visitor centers started shutting down. And, um, you know, it became very obvious that we would have to look at some new approaches. Um, a lot of areas experienced a high increase of visitation because families were looking to social distance and they had kids at home and they were looking to get out. And so while other areas were kind of shutting down, we had other public lands that were just booming. Um, and so with summertime, you know, and the schools being out of session, it gave us a time to pause and look at what was happening and recognize that things would not be returning to normal per se in the coming school year and that we would have to provide more distance learning resources um, for the field offices to be able to provide their education programs like they normally would. And so as we started looking into this and there were many um, calls over the summertime uh, to figure this out, we realized a lot of our um, offices maybe didn't have the necessary uh, tools and resources they needed to even make a distance learning program um, accessible to local schools or you know partner groups or anything like that um, and so one of the things that we recognize that at headquarters that we could do is to try and break down some of those barriers to provide greater access to distance learning opportunities at the field level and within the bureau what we see is our education programs are really led at the field level, at visitor centers, monuments, conservation areas. They're very place-based, focused on the local resource and trying to allow um, each of those sites that opportunity to still provide access. And <clears throat> as the Bureau of Land Management's education program bureau-wide, you know, we strive to provide access to recreation opportunities and enhance our, our agency's mission and promote conservation stewardship through our education programs. And so this is something we definitely did not want to see drop. And so partnering with NAAAE and um, other organizations and other uh, public land management agencies, we've been able to kind of pull together some resources of what works and what other people are doing, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, um, working with social media teams, uh, providing, you know, some of those virtual field trips or providing um, maybe on a Zoom platform that way and different opportunities based on whatever that field office um, is able to provide. And so some of our barriers is, um, you know, we mentioned already some of the technology divide that we see and a lot of uh, public land that we manage is in rural areas. And a lot of rural areas have difficulty accessing the internet, making it, a, it can be a bit of a challenge, but also some of our offices don't have access to Wi-Fi or the internet that would provide the ability to um, even present some of these programs. And so we've been working to try and figure out work around um, either enhancing Wi-Fi access or providing offices with the necessary equipment they need to provide better distance learning programs. Um, and one of the um, one of our great offices that's kind of leading the charge in this in Alaska is the Camel Creek Science Center. And they have been at the forefront in our agency of utilizing new technology, figuring out what is working best and being able to be the first ones to get a lot of programs online and allowing people to access that. And so you've, you're probably gonna see a bit of a contrast here on purpose. I was sandwiched in between Laura's awesome presentation on adaptation 
um, a different type of adaptations of how we can move our programs online. And then Louisa Wolfline from Campbell Creek Science Center and her great presentation. And this is done intentional so you can see a, a bit of a contrast of what is possible um, in presenting online. And I want to turn the time now over to Louisa to show and highlight some of the wonderful things that Campbell Creek Science Center has been doing. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I am going to just take a second here to transfer over. And I think you should all see my first slide now. Yep. Great. Um, so thanks so much. And it is a real pleasure to be here um, sharing information about what we've been doing. I wanted to start just by giving a little context um, for the work we've been doing at the Campbell Creek Science Center. The BLM Campbell Creek Science Center is a science and environmental education center in Anchorage, Alaska, and we've been in operation since 1996. It is the mission of the Science Center to engage all learners in outdoor uh, experiences that increase appreciation, connection, and stewardship of Alaska's public lands and natural resources. About six years ago, BLM Alaska expanded our mandate uh, to include providing environmental education outreach support to BLM Alaska, BLM Alaska offices across the entire state. So not only were we doing programming locally, but also helping everybody across Alaska, which is a huge geographic region. Uh, the Science Center is situated on BLM managed land called the Campbell Tract. Um, which is 730 acres of forests and fields and creeks, um, our namesake creek, and we use that area for our outdoor classroom. We normally serve about 45,000 people uh, a year, and um, one of our main things is on-site field trips for area school school age kids from the area. Um, we also offer a range of other programming. Um, we do public events, we have adult classes, evening lectures, a program for very young children and their caregivers, um, naturalist hikes, exploratory hikes, um, and we also offer professional development training. We do Alaska natural history training for tour guides, we do um, certified interpretive guide training, and we do place-based service learning professional development for teachers um, from across Alaska. To fulfill our statewide support mandate, <clears throat> excuse me, we do a range of different activities depending on the office that we're supporting, um, from helping taking middle schoolers north of the Arctic Circle to learn about ecology and real life science um, happening on the ground in the moment, uh, to hosting Iditarod sled dog race uh, event at our facility, to helping an office work through an interpretive plan for uh, wayside exhibits. Um, the Science Center also started doing, um, had started to do uh, some distance learning programs before uh, COVID hit. But um, as you might guess from just this quick rundown of things we do, uh, that most of our programming before March 2020 was in person. One other thing, or a couple other things to know about the Science Center um, is that uh, about three years ago, um, under the guidance of our then new director, Nancy Patterson, um, our staff came together to create a vision story to revise and refine our mission statement and to develop a strategic plan. And in that strategic plan, we specifically identified a desire to enhance our use of technology in our programming um, and had identified ways that we might do that. And a large reason for that desire was to make it uh, more easy for us to meet the uh, statewide mandate that we had to reach audiences across the state, because travel in Alaska can be really expensive. 
Um, and one other thing um, is just that our, our, work, our work group at the Science Center um, has always um, been a very positive team-oriented group. Um, and I think that was deepened by the work that we've done for the past three years in social emotional learning as a team. Um, so uh, then COVID hit, um, that's our context, COVID hit. And when that happened um, as a team, we asked ourselves, how could we best serve our community given this new set of circumstances? How could we continue to meet our mission? How could we help people stay connected to nature? So I'm now gonna share some of the things, um, the answers to those questions, what they look like at the Science Center. So um, right in the beginning as a staff, um, we acknowledged um, how, how grounding it is to be in nature and that we wanted to create um, easy ways for families, for individuals, for students to observe the natural world. Um, we wanted to provide um, activities that were safe and secure and centering. And we set about uh, creating a collection of simple Alaska relevant activities to get people outside and support their learning about the environment. Um, and we called them nature learning resources and we made them available for free at our website. We uh, developed a template for the activities so they had a consistent look. We imagined all the people who might um, use them and thought about how could we make them as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. So the activities themselves, we made them simple, requiring few materials. Um, and the materials that they do need are things that people have around their homes. Um, we made them possible to do in a variety of um, access to nature situations. Um, just like Laura talked about, you know, we knew, you know, some people would have access to a park. Others might just be able or would be able to get out into their backyard. That's where they would feel safe. And some people maybe the place that they would feel safe or have access to is just looking out the window. Um, we wanted people to be able to do them without access to a printer. Um, so our directions included ways, you know, included things that you could do so you didn't have to print them out. And as we refined our understanding of technology, uh, we made sure that our data sheets or bingo sheets um, or whatever were fillable. So that made it possible for people to do the um, activities even without a computer if they had a cell phone. Uh, the activities, like good environmental educators, um, we wanted to make them interdisciplinary. We we've been incorporating math, language arts, nature art, movement. Um, we wanted them to be a mix of types of activities, exploratory, contemplative, investigative. And we wanted them to incorporate the social emotional learning um, principles that we've been incorporating into our regular programming. And so we um, included relevant reflective questions. Um, we wanted to get people using them to continue to think and explore and um, just become more engaged in the natural environment. Um, our ideas for the nature learning resources, um, some of them were, were um, adaptations of activities that we already did at the Science Center, and others were um, just new ideas, things that we came up with to encourage the outdoor um, experiences and learning that we wanted to encourage. And as I said, we developed them specifically with Alaskans in mind, but um, they, they are actually, um, they've proven to be relevant to people in other places as well. Oops. There we go. Um, we also looked at ways that we could get these into the hands of as many kids as possible. So we worked with the Anchorage School District uh, to make sure that they were relevant to all learners. We also worked with the school district um, to have them printed and included in the science pickup packets for elementary students um, that were the way the district was getting science out to kids in the spring um, earlier this year. And we worked with the district to get them, <clears throat> excuse me, integrated into the district science uh, units on Canvas, which is what they've been using this fall. Um, 
the district actually went through and linked uh, a, lear a nature learning resource to each different grade level um, for each week for the first 15 weeks of school. And that's been while the kids are, the schools aren't open yet here. Um, for in-person learning, that is. Um, so uh, we also promoted the nature learning resources to other school districts. We worked um, with the Alaska Department of Education and got them um, in included on their uh, website page that they shared with teachers across the state. Um, and we shared them with our partners who in turn shared them through their networks. And finally, um, we just shared them directly through um, our contacts, other contacts, and through social media. I mentioned earlier that as part of our statewide outreach before COVID, we had piloted a handful of distance learning programs. Um, we had also um, been looking at the kind of programming available in Alaska, and we recognized that uh, a lot of programs, distance learning programs in Alaska, were in the end being delivered to people outside of Alaska. So as we pivoted, we focused really on offering programs specifically designed for Alaskans. Um, our staff, um, like Laura described earlier, um, we, we thought about the programs that we did for on-site um, education and we thought about how to adapt them for the virtual environment. Um, and, and so, um, so we created, we created a, we've been creating a suite of uh, virtual programs that sort of mirror uh, our on-site in-person programs that we gave. Um, and then we did, we've done an adaptation of those um, to create a regular weekly program called Alaska Explorers that um, we developed specifically with kids who are home learning in mind. So they might be kids who are, have long been part of homeschool environment, um, or um, they may be kids who are learning at home now while waiting for school to open in person. Um, as our staff um, took the topics from our most popular programs, they were figuring out how to do those programs in a virtual environment. And part of that process um, has been schooling ourselves in best practices. And I will say that information from Beatles and from NAAAE has been really helpful for us in this process. Over time too, our programs have become increasingly interactive. Um, Laura also described wanting to have an outdoor component. So, and we've done the same thing. Our staff linked um, each of our distance learning programs to at least one of the nature learning resources that we had um, created. Um, and uh, Laura also described a whole bunch of different tools that they've been using. Our focus so far has um, uh, been to um, make our programs as interactive as possible within the Zoom platform. Um, and that just has meant that neither us nor our audience has, we haven't had to worry about their access to different platforms or different tools. Um, and we've been able through Zoom to send kids on scavenger hunts um, for items around their homes, to have them draw uh, made up animals with adaptations, to have them flap their arms to match bird wing beats. Um, We've had them map their yards. We've made time for them to go look out the window and come back and report on their bird sightings. Um, so anyway, that's been our approach. In addition to um, providing programming for kids, um, we've also been developing virtual programming for other audiences. So um, pretty early on, I think back in May, we decided that the um, lecture series that we offer every October through April that we would just plan then that we would do it virtually. Uh, and um, we actually got excited about the ease at which we'd be able to bring speakers in from all over and the um, the reach that we would have by doing them virtually. 
uh, we we practiced, you know, we did a couple of pilots. Um, we tried to do using the Teams platform and did a program on sea kayaking in Alaska. We were really excited by the number of people who attended and they did come from across Alaska, from the lower 48, and even from uh, countries like Indonesia and Australia. So it was really exciting to see that happen. Uh, every year we do a, well, we've always done a mushroom fair in person. And this year when we reached out to um, the people we work with for that, we discovered that they were planning a regional uh, fungus festival. And so we joined forces with them. We hosted uh, the keynote address and we had more than 218 people attend, which um, we were pretty excited about. Another um, virtual thing that we've been doing is Agents of Discovery. And this is a geo-referenced mobile game app. Um, we had created a number of missions for the Campbell Track. Um, and with um, COVID-19 and with um, kind of our support to the rest of the state in mind, we were able to develop a mission in this platform that could, could be done anywhere. Instead of being geotagged to the Campbell Track, um, we created signs that had QR codes on them. And to complete the mission, you actually scanned the QR code. And we shared um, those signs with all the BLM offices in Alaska so that um, they could post them um, you know, in campgrounds or uh, wherever they wanted to, if they wanted to have people do this mission where they are. Um, this, uh, this webinar is about online learning, but I did want to just mention um, something else that we did, which um, helped us engage with the public, even though we couldn't do face-to-face -face programming. And um, as Rachel mentioned, you know, we've had, we knew, we, there have been a lot of people out on the land and we knew that they would be coming. We knew that they would be biking and walking, um, hiking, everything. And um, so we wanted to engage with them. We knew we couldn't do face-to-face. -face. So our low-tech solution was to develop a series of pop-up walks. And these were, have been ephemeral interactive signs that we would post on different trails for a short amount of time and then engage the people in particular topics. So you can see here, um, we did one on nature yoga, and we did one on birding, we did one on mindfulness, and we did one um, just across the bridge that crosses the creek by us um, on salmon. Um, and again, we shared these signs with BLM offices across the state so that they could put them up in their campgrounds or around their visitor centers as well. Uh, normally in March, we have thousands of children coming to see us, um, and it was hard for us not to have those kids come. Um, it was hard for us not to lead natural history training for guides or bird walks every week in May. Um, and uh, the pivot to developing virtual programming presented a whole bunch of new challenges for us. Um, and we have definitely been learning as we go. We've tried different media, we've learned new things, we've incorporated what worked well, we've discarded what didn't. Um, getting access to Zoom was a huge step forward for us and one that we are really grateful for. So I just wanna say thanks to Rachel and Derek for that. And I wanna close um, by just saying, you know, we, and that's we, everybody on this call, we're all environmental educators. Uh, we understand resilience. We know how to engage our audience. We know how to help them create connections to nature. And we know how to deepen caring. And so um, at the Science Center, we had months and months of um, interacting with no members of the public. Virtual programming has offered us the opportunity to reach audiences again and to reach audiences we, that we didn't have access to before. And um, you know, for us, seeing kids, seeing tour guides, teachers, the general public um, on screens um, has made everybody on our staff super happy. And that's it. Thank you so much, Louisa and Rachel and Laura. 
What great information um, and ideas. Um, we're, we have a few questions, but I want to see if Nancy or Derek have any questions that they want to ask or thoughts that you have based on what you heard, but that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Judy. Yeah, I would just thanks uh, to Louisa and Laura. Those are both really uh, great presentations and I agree with someone in the chat. It's just, it's nice and inspiring to hear that people are, are moving forward and really, you know, kind of thinking, how do we do things differently and how, how do we still continue to do this just incredibly important work? I guess I have, I do have one question or maybe a couple of different questions, but one is going back to Laura's presentation. Um, I'm kind of curious, if you could speak to some of your experience with uh, some of the tools that you listed, like the virtual whiteboards and, and some of the other things on that slide. I mean, I think um, maybe a lot of us have used some of the Google tools, but some of that other stuff, some of the other things like Flippity and Minty and other things are, I think, new to some of us. So, so um, being environmental educators, one of the key criteria for selecting these tools with was that they're free <laughs> and uh, easy to get. So that was one of the things that we looked at first. And all of those uh, materials, at least in, or um, tools, at least in some format are free. There's some paid versions of some of them as well, but mostly free. And we try to use tools that we can very quickly share in Zoom, for example, when we're doing live sessions that people can participate by clicking a link and, and and doing something very quickly. So um, Miro, um, Jamboard, all of those are, are link enabled. Um, you set it up ahead of time, but you link it in the, um, in the meeting and usually in the chat, and then people can access those immediately. So it's not, it does not require them to download something or um, have that program in place those are the criteria that we use to select those. So those are, those are all of the, um, uh, all of those tools are available in that, in that format, if that makes sense. So yeah. the whiteboards are awesome um, just because it allows people to do things like put sticky notes down and put pictures up and rearrange them and they can all be looking at the same thing and moving things around within those whiteboards. So it's really great for kind of group think activities for sure. And Flippity the same way. There's there's all sorts of really cool tools on Flippity to create like virtual scavenger hunts or the board games or right. randomizer kind of spinning the wheel sorts of things. Um, all sorts of games that again, it's a link in the website. You don't need to down it, download anything and you can immediately access that as a participant. Okay, thanks. And we had a question come in, um, Nancy, before I turn it over to you from Catherine. Does, does any of you use um, video editing tools? Are there any free examples that you have? And if not, we have some other resources that we can send Catherine, but I just wondered if anybody had any suggestions there. Anybody? Okay. I don't And Nancy, any thoughts that you have? I think just a couple of things to summarize what, what I've been hearing on this conversation today is uh, that one thing that's been really important for Camel Creek Science and our team, as Luis was sharing, is that idea of, of us really working together and thinking and brainstorming what we could do and what made sense within the scope of our mission and our and the goals of our work. And I think we've held that really solidly throughout this whole time of just how, how healing nature is, how important it is to help people get outside, and that that's created a lot of grounding for us as a team to then think really creatively about uh, what are some different ways that we can we can help our community experience public lands and get outside. And then the other piece with that too is is thinking about who are our partners, who are the people who can support the work we're doing, and who who can we help support in return. And so that's everything like what Luis is describing of the um, Anchorage School District and other school districts throughout Alaska, and then also reaching out with our BLM folks. I, Derek and, and Rachel have been instrumental at helping us, as Luisa shared, and um, same, we've had support from Yaquinahead and from um, Canyons of the Ancients and a number of other sites to really think about what we could do and then 
um, what we could do at our site and what could scale out to other BLM sites too. So it's been a, it's, it's a strange time for all of us. It's also something I think that's helped us realize how we can, we as environmental educators can connect together uh, across great geographic distances with that shared purpose of, of bringing people into more of a relationship with nature and, and fostering a really positive place in a time that might feel really chaotic. And so I've, I've, been, um, I've been so fortunate to get to spend this time with everyone and, and want to thank you all for sharing your knowledge and, and thoughts about ways we can inspire people to connect with nature. Thank you, Nancy and Derek and everybody. We had a couple of other questions coming in. One was, how can we better link the non-formal education community with the formal education in terms of distance learning and making those connections? And another one was related to any type of equipment you needed to have, especially I think Louisa and Nancy, this is for you, a BLM, in addition to a laptop. Is there anything else you had to get? So those were two questions and Anne might have some more. We've, I can start with that and yeah. then Louisa, if you've got anything um, to add there with the, we've been mostly using our BLM um, laptops and then using the Zoom. So we have a BLM um, Zoom license that we're able to use with the Washington office. And then we've worked with our friends of Campbell Creek Science Center as well to help support some of that technology. Um, the, but mostly we've been using just pretty basic technology and that's been an important, important feature as we, um, especially as we've started out, we've wanted to keep things as engaging as possible just through one, one platform. So uh, we work with a lot of, of uh, children K-6, which is pretty common, but um, we, instead of flipping from one platform to another platform, we just wanted to try to create a lot of engaging tools within the Zoom um, platform. And I think kind of a 2.0 for us, we might start doing things um, if it's available to us, like some of those other free sources and, and um, like Mentimeter, things like that, we might look into that a little bit more. But right now we've been really using that um, Zoom platform and then engaging within that. And then a couple of the tools that we've been working on getting um, include things like document cameras. Uh, so that's also a thanks to, to our Washington office to help support that. And why we want that is that you can have an overhead view of something. So instead of trying to hold up a skull or something like that in front of a small web camera, you can actually have a greater detail using a document camera that hooks right into your computer or using a microscope for the same uh, reason. So we're piloting that right now for a creek program that we have in a couple of weeks so that kids can actually see all of the critters that live inside of a creek and um, and get a zoom in that they might not be able to get otherwise. So those are a couple of technologies That's of great. technology that we're using. I have one more question I want to throw in that came in at registration. Uh, this person's asking, you know, at some point we're going to be coming back to in-person learning, fingers crossed. And they were asking if, if you're thinking about incorporating any new practices or making anything as part of your permanent offerings or the ways that you run your programs or ways that you do business. Um, any permanent changes you're considering and how are you reimagining environmental education after COVID? Any thoughts on that? Louisa, it looks like you're smiling at me. Do you have a response and, or? And or oh, Laura? No. <laughs> I was just uh, thinking like how hard it is to, for any of us to know if we should jump in. <laughs> um, well, we, as you might guess, we're really looking forward to the day when we have people back on site. Um, and I think, um, I think you know, I mentioned that we, we had already envisioned, before it hit, we had already envisioned using more technology. And um, kind of a silver lining of all this for us is that it, it forced us, you know, to drop the, you know, distracting in-person programs and really develop our um, use of technology. And going forward, um, I see us, I, I see us just continuing to use this. Um, it's just so valuable for reaching 
a really broad audience and reaching because our state is so huge, um, being able to reach kids in remote villages, um, in communities. We have so many communities off the road system, like to be able to reach them um, with this technology. I just see it that really continuing and a kind of silver lining yeah. to being forced to really think creatively and get busy developing. And, and go ahead, Laura. I'm super glad to hear that because I know that our kids from Kansas would love to be able to visit Alaska um, <laughs> virtually. And um, I know that many of our programs have um, pivoted toward, I hate that word, sorry, that's all we say right now is pivot, but um, they have moved toward doing camp programs even virtually where they're sending out camp kits. Um, uh, to parents so that the kids have all the materials that they need to do and then facilitating activities virtually. And one of the, the silver linings in that was we had kids participating in camp programs um, from all over the place. They were from all over, not just from Kansas. And, um, and I think so a lot of our, our people who are delivering programs like this will continue to offer some version of that and are starting to offer more virtual field trips um, and opportunities for, you know, our state is not as big as Alaska, but we have a lot of remote kids in the, in parts of our state that are, um, don't get the opportunities to go see some of the places that they might, uh, their counterparts in more populated areas might get to, so. Well, thanks to all of you and to uh, everybody listening for all the great ideas coming in on video editing and other tools. So thank you all for all those insights because I really feel like we um, will be doing virtual learning for a long time and we're learning all the time. I will tell you that NAA is working with um, Virginia Tech and Clemson and we're gonna be launching a survey on how people, and Laura, to use your word, have pivoted during this time. Um, and what are those practices that we're using now that might continue in the future? And also looking at equity and inclusion issues and how that has influenced our work. So more to come. Does anybody have any final words before we turn it over to Anne and close this out? Any other last thoughts for the general good? May I add one? Yes, please. This goes a little towards your, the question that was just posed to and about what's the future with environmental education. Yeah. For us at the Science Center, I think this has been such an invaluable time to diversify the portfolio of what we offer and to keep it really relevant and meaningful. And so, so often it, I think we can just put walls on what, what we're able to do and say that we only do things in person and we only do these types of programs. And all of a sudden through these virtual experiences, now as Louisa shared, now we can more easily reach that statewide mandate to provide environmental education throughout Alaska. And it also means that as professionals, we can connect more easily with each other. We can keep ideas generating. Um, we can bring in professionals virtually that maybe we wouldn't be able to fly up to Alaska or do other things with. So I think it really has broadened our diversity, our broadened and diversified our portfolio of what we can do and what possibilities are out there. And to me, that's a really exciting future as well. Thank you. Great words to end on. Thank you all so, so much. And Anne, turn it over to you to close us out. Just to close for the next minute, I'm just gonna give everybody a reminder that we will be sharing the notes and everyone's slides and the recording. I will get that out to your emails by the end of the day tomorrow. And we'll also be sharing it on EE Pro on the same page you use to register for this webinar. And if you enjoy today's webinar, we've got lots um, on our site to check out. If you go to EE Pro and go to that section that says monthly webinar series, you can find all of our past webinars the recordings, the notes, the slides. And that is also the best place to find out all about what's coming up ahead. So check that out. And lastly, just wanna take the next minute to invite all of you to please come to our virtual conference. It starts next week and with our 17th annual research symposium and our 49th annual regular conference. It all begins on Monday next week. We are going virtual and you are all invited to join us. Hope many of you can be there. And we have nearly 400 live and on-demand sessions. 
And with conference registration, you'll have access to all of these sessions for nearly a year. So it is an incredible offering of content and information. We have a great lineup of speakers and presenters, and you can read all about them on our conference website now. And as a special pre-conference plenary, we've got a wonderful webinar on October 6th, all about how do you build an active and engaged public, specifically focusing on media literacy, discourse, and civic education. The entire panel is gonna be moderated by Dr. Kay Kawashima Ginsburg. It is incredible. And you don't actually need to be registered for the conference. It's free, as Laura mentioned, we love our free resources and free webinars. So join us, you can register for this webinar today. Really great um, panel that we've got lined up. And lastly, we are gonna be taking the month of October off to focus on our conference and we'll be restarting our webinar series in November. So we hope to see so many of you at our conference starting next week. And that's it for me. Thanks everybody, take care and we hope to see you on another webinar soon. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you, Anne. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.